walk. And so as we were, as we were going up, the creek was filling with water because it was a torrential downpour. So like, let's float the creek back to the entrance. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's like, I already had one near-death experience in Austin, Texas. This was about to be my second. Um, but anyway, you know, I'm, 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 I'm buying into the hype. And so I'm like, you know what, let's just do it. Let's just, be, let's just be boys. Let's get in the creek. Let's float down. This is going to be an awesome memory. And it was. Uh, but it was also, it wasn't awesome until after I was safely, you know, to the end. But the entire time during, I was like, this is stupid. This, this, was, this was a huge mistake. But we're, we're, we're floating this creek down. And so there's, there's like several different types of terrain. Uh, there's, it's all deep. And, you know, I'm like terrified of deep water. Um, but I'm floating down this creek, and there's periods where it's calm and it's peaceful. I'm like, oh, this is kind of nice. And then you get to parts where it's shallow, and there's rapids. And there's, like, rocks. We're not on floats or anything, so we're just floating across rocks, getting scraped up. And someone got stuck behind a log. It was crazy. Almost drowned, getting pinned by a log. I mean, insane. And I'm just, the entire time, I'm like, why did we do this? This makes no sense to me. But then, you know, it gets peaceful again. I'm like, oh, okay, this is cool. This is good. I like this. And then we get to this, like, kind of bluff slash cliff thing. And there's, like, a torrential whirlpool thing kind of going on. And they're like, let's jump in it and, and go to the other side. And I was like, I was like, who are my friends? <laughs> I was like, what am I? I'm, I'm from the hood. We don't do this where I'm from. So, you know, we don't, we don't go and jump in whirlpools. It's just not a thing that we do for fun. But I was like... When in Rome, so they jumped in, and they're just, you know, woohoo, it's awesome. I jump in, and I'm like, this is the end for me. I'm, I'm going to die. I, I literally jump in, and I'm immediately swept away by the current, and I'm like, I can feel myself circling around, and I'm just like, ah, uh, help. <laughs> like, what's going on? I just hear, I can't, I can't see anything because water's like shooting up all around me, and, you know, I just hear like, ah, oh, you'll be fine. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm dying. And then eventually, I just, it just shoots me out to like a calm space again. And then we're done. And I was like, let's go home. Let's, let's just go home. I'm done. And you know, it, 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 the next day, I was like, oh, that was awesome. Like, <laughs> that was great. Would I do it again? Maybe. Well, probably not, because I have kids now. So I feel like I can't do the stupid things that I used to do. Um, less, less risk back then. Now, I got a lot more to lose. So... But anyway, you know, I, I think of uh, discipleship, and I, I think of following Jesus and, and this life that we live as we try to follow Jesus, and it's a lot like that creek. It's a lot like that creek. There are, there are periods where it's exciting, and you're like, I don't know if I want to do this, but you know what, we're going to go for it. And you get in the water, and then you go, you're, you're going along, and it's calm, it's peaceful, it's fine. You're like, everything's great, but then you hit the rapids. And then you're like, why did I do this? This doesn't make sense. I'm not really seeing the logic here but behind my decision to do this. Then it's peaceful again. And then you get to a torrential whirlpool where you feel like you're going to die, right? It, it, we, we, we go through the ebbs and the flows as we follow Jesus. And I, I look at those rapids and that whirlpool, that's persecution. That's the hardship. That's the suffering. That's the times where it's like, I don't really know if I want to do this. Or, you know, I, I think I made a mistake. Or something isn't right here because it's not supposed to be like this. This wasn't my expectation, right? But I, I, I see life that way. And I think facing persecution can, can feel like the part of the creek that just leaves you with that, this was all a big mistake type of a feeling. But persecution, like Janice talked about last week, is an inevitable part, inevitable part of following Jesus. All right, he talked about those who lie and those who live. Those who live a life following Jesus will experience persecution. All right, those who live the life of a disciple trust in God. And so it's something to be expected. But what I want to talk about this morning is the experience of following Jesus. Right? That, that creek, this life that we do called discipleship, it's one grand experience, and we got to experience it all. We, we don't get to pick the sections of the creek that we want to float through. It's like, you got to take it as it comes. 
and you got to figure out your way through it. So the title of my message this morning is The Persecuted in the Master's Footsteps. And I, I want to talk about two things that we experienced this morning when we face persecution, right? So obviously the precursor here is that if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've made the decision to place your faith in Jesus, to repent, to be baptized, then you're going to face persecution at some point, in some form. But in that persecution, we get to experience, I think, two very incredible and amazing things. And so we're going to pick it up here in John chapter 15. We'll start in verse 18. It says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. The persecuted get to experience two things in, in their decision to follow Jesus. And the first is we get to experience the life of Jesus. The life of Jesus is what those who are persecuted are experiencing. The world hated Jesus because he spoke the truth. He made claims that people did not want to hear. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. He claimed to provide freedom from sin. He claimed to be able to set captives free. These were bold and courageous claims. And not only did he make these claims, he challenged the people around him. He didn't just let people walk around doing whatever they wanted to do. He said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak out and speak up and take a stand for what is actually true. And as a result, people hated him for it. They wanted nothing to do with him. They thought he was a liar. They thought he was a blasphemer. They hated him. Jesus was persecuted. And he let his disciples know ahead of time, you're going to experience the exact same thing. In fact, the world hated me first, and they're going to hate you too. He says, don't, don't be surprised by what's going to come, right? I, I think Jesus is, is preparing the disciples for what's to come. Like, hey, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to walk in my footsteps, you will experience the life that I live. Not just the good and the exciting, but also the hard and the challenging. You will experience the darkest and the ugliest parts of the human heart. Right? He said, you don't just get to experience all the fun stuff. Right? This isn't, it, this isn't just going to be a life of me multiplying fish and bread all the time right? and, and, and doing all these amazing miracles. And there would be many more miracles, but there would also be persecution. Now, I love what Jesus says here. No servant is greater than his master. He says the same thing earlier in John chapter 13 when he, when he lowers himself and humbles himself and washes the feet of the 12 apostles a role and a task that was below even a servant and a slave. Like, he lowered himself literally to the lowest point and washed their feet. And he told them the same thing. A servant is not greatest, greater than his master. You will be expected to do the same thing. And the same concept applies here. A servant is not greater than his master. If I have to face persecution, you have to face persecution. Because as servants, you are not above me. And I think Jesus wanted to drill this into their minds. He wanted them to understand, this is what you're going to face. When you take a stand for the truth, when you preach the good news, when you strive to love God and love people in the way that I've commanded you to do, 
the world will hate you. Because that is not the status quo in the world. It isn't, right? We, we, we've, we've been talking about persecution all month. We've been talking about the Beatitudes all year, right? And the status quo of the world, as we've studied, is quite different than Jesus' status quo. And so when we make the decision to follow in the master's footsteps, the world is going to look at the disciples and say, you know, we don't like that. You guys need to get in line. And when they say no, there will be persecution. But all of this is part of the experience of the life of Jesus. Every single part of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We don't get to just keep the good. And I think a good question that, I, that I've been asking myself, but I think I want to ask all of us, is how far are we willing to go in order to experience the life of Jesus? How far are you willing to walk in the footsteps of Jesus? When I was in that creek, there were multiple points where I could have swam to the side and got out. I could have, you know, I was like, I, this looks kind of challenging, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to swim over here. I'm going to get out. I'm going to walk the rest of the way. I'm going to do my own thing. But I didn't do it. So I was like, ah, I don't want to be a punk <laughs> in front of my friends. Um, probably not the best line of logic, but it worked out in the end. But I, I think that's something we do have to ask ourselves, right? How far are we willing to go to experience the life of Jesus? Persecution, as we've discussed all month, it is one of those inevitable things. It will come. If you are living the life of a disciple, persecution will come in some way. And if we want to be disciples, we have to stand for the truth like Jesus did. We have to extend peace to people who probably want nothing to do with it like Jesus did. We have to be willing to challenge people on the way they live their lives and call them to a higher standard like Jesus did. We have to be willing to love those that the world deems unlovable and to preach the truth no matter what, just like Jesus did. And we must also be willing to suffer persecution, like Jesus did. A servant is not greater than his master. But my fear is that some of us carry ourselves like we are greater than our master. We act like we are greater than Jesus. When we say, I refuse to put myself in situations that make me uncomfortable or that might lead, lead me to face persecution in some, some way, shape, or form, because my own peace and my own comfort is more important to me than risking it at the hands of somebody who may not respond well. That is the heart of someone who does not see Jesus as the greatest. That's the heart of someone who feels like, man, I, I don't deserve this. Or perhaps you think to yourself, I do all the things that I need to do, but I'm not going to risk offending others or, or stepping on toes for the sake of holding to the truth. Right? I'm just going to focus on me. I'm going to do what I need to do to get by, and that's it. That's not how Jesus was. That's not the, that's not the master that we follow. That's not what we see in the footsteps that he left for us to follow. But, man, when we, when we think like that, we are saying that we are greater than our master. When we are in situations and we know that, man, the spirit is prompting me to do something, or, or I feel called to do something, I, want, I need to share my faith with this person. I see the sin happening in this brother or this sister's life, but I don't want to call them out because I don't want them to get mad at me. Or, you know, I, I see this type of behavior carrying on in my workplace. It's like, oh, well, they're not Christians, so I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just not going to be a light. Right? When we, when we put ourselves in those situations and we're unwilling to take a stand for Jesus, we're saying that we're greater. And Jesus said, no, the world is going to hate you. The world is not supposed to love you. They're not supposed to look at you and think, oh, you look just like everyone else. You're just like us. This is great. No. Right? And I'm not, I'm not saying we got to go out and, and, you know, condemn people to hell left and right. That, that's not what I'm saying. That's not how Jesus operated. But Jesus did speak up. Jesus took a stand. 
And I, I think we have to be willing to do the same things. If we want to follow in the master's footsteps, then we got to be willing to experience it all, right? Not just when it's easy, when the water's peaceful and it's calm and it's fun, and it's like, oh, man, all my friends are here. It's like, man, the church is great. You know, it's just great. But Jesus is like, no, the, the, the church in Acts was scattered. It's like, we're not just going to stay together and not preach the word. We're not just going to stay in Jerusalem and not preach the truth. It's like, no, go to the corners of the world and preach the truth. And you will be persecuted for it. But that's part of the experience. If you want to be like me, if you want to experience my life, that's part of it. And I want to ask us this morning, again, how far are we willing to go? How much of the life of Jesus are you willing to experience? Some of it or all of it? If the answer is some of it, that's not discipleship. We say Jesus is Lord and, and we want to follow Jesus. We say, I want everything that comes with it. Persecution and all. And don't get me wrong. There are so many awesome moments being a disciple. Those fun times are so much fun. I love going to the Jubilee. I love church every Sunday. Um, I love, you know, just hanging out, spending time together playing volleyball on campus with the campus ministry and, and, you know, going and playing tennis with Jace. It's just, we're just, you know, swinging our rackets and just hanging out. It's awesome. It's great. It's so much fun. But we can't, we can't compromise on the rest of discipleship as well, right? We are called to preach the truth. We are called to take a stand and we are called to face persecution. And we have to be willing to go the lengths that we need to go in order to experience it. Amen? Yes. You know, I, I really want to lift up uh, Daniel Smith. He, he uh, taught a lesson for the guys uh, for Men's Midweek a couple of weeks ago, and he just, shared, he just shared all about his life. Shared about becoming a disciple. He shared about going on the mission field here to Columbia and just all of the experiences that came with that. Choose, making, a, making a choice to be uncomfortable, to sacrifice so he could come and help plant this church. And he talked about the persecution that he faced. He talked about the challenges with, with his parents and, and how they were against him coming to, to plant a church here in Columbia. They had, they had issues with the church in general. that they, they didn't like it. They didn't like what he was doing. And they were vocal about it. And they tried to get him to not go and to not be a part of the church. Persecution from his own family. But what I respect about Daniel is he said, I'm going to go. Because this isn't about people. This isn't about others and what they think. It's about God. This is about me experiencing the life of Jesus. I feel called to go, so I'm going to go. And whatever persecution comes, let it come. And now he's here. And now he's married. And he has two kids who are faithful disciples. And I was like, man, that's awesome. That's part of the experience. Right? I think so many times we look at the persecution that comes and we just get stuck there. We're like, oh man, I don't know how I'm going to get to the other side of that. I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. But man, when we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and we stay focused on having the experience of the life that he lived, we'll get through it. And it may not be all sunshine and rainbows. You may come out mangled, tattered, worn down. But I guarantee you that even in that state, you were better off than you were before the persecution. You're more faithful, you're more refined, you're more fired up, and you're more committed than you were before. But that only happens when you choose to experience everything that comes with it. Amen? You know, let's keep reading here. Let's pick it up in chapter 15, verse 26. It says, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. 
None of you asked me where you were going. Rather, you are filled with grief because I've said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. You know, Jesus continues to to expand upon what's to come for the disciples. He talks about the advocate coming and and how, hey, the, the advocate, the spirit, the helper is going to come, and he will testify, and you must also testify. And he says that you're going to be put out of the synagogue. You're not going to be allowed in there anymore. People are going to put you out. They're going to throw you out of there. In fact, people are going to take your life, and they're going to think that they're doing a good thing. They're going to think that they are serving God when they take your life from you. And each one of these apostles, save for Judas, who killed himself, would experience this. They were martyred. They were killed for their testimony and for their faith. Jesus wasn't bluffing. He, he wasn't just saying, like, you know, it may happen. It may not. He's like, no, this is going to happen to you. And I think the, most people rationally would go, I, I don't know about that. You, what, what do you mean they're going to kill me? Well, what do you mean they're going to kill me in the name of God? You mean I'm going to die for this? I'm going to lose my life for this? A servant is not greater than his master. The master lost his life. It's not going to be any different for the servants. But they had to face this down the road. But Jesus gives a promise. He says, hey, you're not going to be in this alone. You're not just going to have to fend for yourself. Yes, I am leaving. I I, I do have to go back to the Father, but it is good for me to go back because that means I can send the advocate to you. The advocate being the Holy Spirit. And I I love that term, advocate. Um, I was looking it up, and uh, apparently it's a a legal term used today that uh, essentially means someone who fights for or defends the cause of someone else. And, and that's what the Holy Spirit gets to be to the disciples. It's like, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not just going to leave you out to dry. You, you will have help. You will still have me in the form of the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's a comfort. It's, it's reassurance. It's, it's the, the, the Holy Spirit. And I feel like, you know, you could probably stand to talk about the Holy Spirit a little bit more. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's a he. The Holy Spirit is not a thing, it's God. Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to be gone physically, but I will be with you in spirit. And we say that all the time, like, oh, I'll be there in spirit, like, you'll feel me there. It's like, no, nah, you won't, I'm, I'm not there. So <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to be there physically or in spirit. I'm staying home, right? It's like, but that's not what Jesus means. Jesus literally means, I will be with you in spirit. And when Jesus says that, right, we know from Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes to those who repent and are baptized and indwells within the followers of Jesus. So we are not alone. The disciples were not alone. The Holy Spirit would would give them the words to say. The Holy Spirit would testify on behalf of God. The Holy Spirit would aid the disciples in preaching the truth. The Holy Spirit would convict the world about sin, about righteousness, about judgment. They weren't alone. And that's the second thing the persecuted experience. They experience comfort through the Holy Spirit. There is a comfort and a peace and a reassurance and a confidence and a security that comes when you know that you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. I, uh, to, 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 it, it's not, I can't describe it to you, okay? I, I, can't, I can't tell you with words what it's like to have the Holy Spirit. But what I can tell you is that the Holy Spirit equips 
and empowers every disciple of Jesus to face whatever challenge they need to face. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. He is a comforter. He comforts those who are hurting, who are mourning, who are grieving, who are persecuted, who are experiencing challenges. Jesus knew that we would need to help. In fact, he said, it's better for me not to be here because there are going to be many more who follow me who need my help. And, you know, Jesus is Jesus. God is God. I don't he could have maybe cloned himself and been all over the place, but that's, that, I, I guess that wasn't ideal. Right. So it's like, hey, I'm sending the advocate. I'm sending the helper. You know, I, I, think, I think about when I was in college and I had to confess my sin. And I had to, I had to share about my struggle with, with same-sex attraction. And I felt afraid, felt timid, felt fearful. Like, what, what are my friends going to think of me? I feared persecution. Where I grew up, that was not tolerated. Grandfather, raised by him, 1944, there was no place for anything like that in his household. And so throughout my life, I cultivated a character of deceit and fear. But one day, the Holy Spirit said, you got to talk about this with somebody. It wasn't in words. There was no audible voice. I didn't hear any voice. I I just, the the prompting of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit prompts you and, and something on your heart and you're like, I should probably do this, you know it. You, you can discern the spirit. And I, that's what I felt. I felt that prompting. But I was so afraid of, of, of being persecuted. I was so afraid of my friends rejecting me, my roommates, treating me differently. You know, I just, I was like, I don't, I don't want to run the risk of persecution. But then in my mind, I was like, how far am I willing to go? Am I willing to give up everything for Jesus? Am I willing to actually live this out? So I told them. I told my campus minister first. He said, tell your roommates. I said, why would you tell me that? He's like, I don't want to do that. I live with them. They're going to think stuff is weird now. But that was his encouragement to me. And I think he told me that because he knew that those guys would love me no matter what. And I felt the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The, the way that they responded to me. You know, I get emotional thinking about it. But... Man, like, I, I, I can't put into words the comfort and the peace that I felt. I was like, surely this is the kingdom of God. Because I get to, I can bear my soul, the darkest parts of my life that I don't even want. It's like, I don't even want these attractions. I didn't ask for them. I don't even want them, but I have them. But it didn't matter to them. And, you know, they, they chose to love me no matter what. And they're still my best friends to this day. And we are better friends because I was vulnerable with them. I think I would not have experienced that comfort. I would not have experienced the peace that comes from the Holy Spirit if I had chosen to say, you know what? I'm not willing to go that far. I'm not willing to go into that territory. Jesus said in this world, we will have many troubles. And those who commit to following Jesus will have troubles. We'll have hardships. We'll have things that we struggle with. We'll have things that we fight against. We'll have things that discourage us. We'll have things that that pull us down. Satan will try to take us out through any any measure of methods. Through persecution, through relationships, through hardships, through suffering, through grief, through loss. So many things. And sometimes it can feel like the world is just caving in on you. Sometimes it can feel like, you know, I I don't see a way out of this. I don't see myself being comforted in this situation and in this scenario. I don't see how God is going to move. Jesus isn't here physically. What am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? But he, the Holy Spirit, God within us, will comfort us. He will give us peace. He will give us the direction that we need to move forward. He will give us the strength and the courage 
and the conviction and the passion and the power that we need to stand firm in the face of any hardship, any trial. How much do you believe that? Or is the Holy Spirit just some arbitrary, abstract concept? Like, oh, I have this, but I don't really know what it means. If that's you this morning, I would encourage you to study it out. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? But he will comfort us. He will and he can get us through anything and everything that we go through. And the reason is because he is God. God lives within those who submit to him and follow his call, follow the call of discipleship and Christianity. The Holy Spirit advocates for us. In those moments where we don't know what to say, in those moments where we find ourselves wanting to take a stand, but we just, we just don't really know how, in those moments where we just can't find the words, the Holy Spirit comes through. He knows, you know, Jesus knows that hardship, the, the hardship that we will face for his sake is going to be hard. And I, I, I'm so grateful and I'm so thankful that Jesus had a plan for us. I'm so grateful that he wasn't just like, okay, figure it out. The last time mankind tried to figure it out, just read the Old Testament. This is complete chaos. We're still trying to figure it out today, and I would say the world is complete chaos. Absolute chaos. But Jesus offers us comfort through the Holy Spirit. When you find yourself in a situation where you have the opportunity to take a stand for Jesus, or perhaps you're facing some type of persecution or hardship, how connected are you to the comfort that comes from the Spirit? And I think this is important, because if we're going to be disciples, we're going to be lifelong disciples of Jesus, we have to learn to rely on the Holy Spirit. God is Spirit. God's Word is truth. And the Holy Spirit is what gives us what we need to get through the many curveballs and hardships and persecutions that life throws at us. And my prayer this morning is that if, if anybody in here is struggling, if anybody in here is persecuted or has faced persecution of some sort, or, or perhaps you just feel like, I don't know how I'm going to get through the rest of today, man, I, I, I pray that you feel the comfort of the Spirit. That's why we read our Bibles. We got to read our Bibles. You want to be connected to the Spirit. You want to find comfort and peace through the Holy Spirit. Get in your Bible. That will connect you to God in a way that nothing else can. Simply that. I want to close with this challenge. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 and 8, Paul tells Timothy, For the Spirit of God, for the Spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Perhaps there's something that you're afraid to do because it may lead you to being persecuted in some way. You know, I was afraid to open up about the things that I struggled with because I feared being persecuted about it. Maybe it's being open about something in your life. Maybe it's, maybe you've been prompted by the Spirit to invite somebody to church or to sit somebody down and study the Bible with them, but you felt afraid because you didn't know how it would go. You didn't know if they respond well. Maybe it's being the odd man out in your classes, in your workplace, as you go throughout your, your daily life, taking a stand for the truth, speaking up and standing up for Jesus. I want to encourage you to look at persecution as an opportunity to experience the life of Jesus and as an opportunity to be comforted and emboldened by the Holy Spirit. This week, when you feel afraid to do something for God, meditate on this passage. Meditate on on John 15, 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 8, and, and dwell on the fact that the Holy Spirit gives you power. If that's not comforting, I don't know what is. 
I, I feel comforted by that because there's so many situations I find myself in where I feel timid, I feel awkward, it feels weird, it feels challenging to do. But when I stop and I think, okay, the spirit God gave me does not make me timid, but makes me powerful. It helps me to love in ways that I am incapable of doing. And it gives me self-discipline that I would not have otherwise. When I, when, I, when I reflect on that and I meditate on that, okay, let me go share my faith with this person. I'm telling you, sometimes I have to do mental gymnastics and give myself pep talks for a solid 10 minutes before I talk to one person. It's like that sometimes. But in the end, I always feel like, man, God, we did that. We did that. Like I overcame this fear through the Holy Spirit. And I, I think God wants all of us to have that same experience, because that's what it's about. That's what, it, that's what it means to follow in the master's footsteps. It's experiencing his life, everything that comes with it, the good things, the hard things, the bad things, the challenging and ugly things. But it's also experiencing that comfort and that peace and the security and the reassurance that comes through the Holy Spirit. And my prayer is that all of this what we talked about this morning and, and, and what we talked about this month is that it, it, it shapes our view of persecution. It, it reorients it a little bit differently to where we don't see it as this awful thing to avoid and to run for the hills from. But we see it as this is a blessing because in this moment, I am more like Jesus than I ever have been before. Wow. Amen? Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this message. Help us be bold. Help us be strong. Uh, so many of us have overcome fears in our lives for things that don't mean anything. Uh, from our parents to our peers to just experiences that we've had. But help us overcome the fears that we have that hold back your kingdom. Help us reach out. Help us love the lost. Help us build our families stronger, our relationships. All those things that even Jason's talking about. Relationships are hard. Relationships uh, can bring up fears. But uh, help us overcome that, that we can share the love of Jesus with everybody and give them the comfort that only your spirit can. That when we're facing persecution, the persecution is coming from the sin in people's lives. And we can help them get rid of that and have the comfort that you give. Thank you for everyone in this room that has um, just added to your kingdom, Father, for, for the times that they have overcome their fears and uh, just followed you, stepped out in faith and, and help us. Uh, get stronger together, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can go ahead and stand up for a closing song by song. Who's now walking down the road, carrying such a heavy load? Sinner, lay your burdens down. Walking hand in hand, singing with the angel band. Old folks ain't so tired no more, cause we're walking on heaven's road. Walking on heaven's road, gotta lay down that heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me, praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way, that's sunshine in every day. Won't Oh, oh, oh.
Just a reminder for all the leaders. Amen? All right, you're dismissed. Love you guys. Have a good Sunday.